Okay, so I think uh, with respect to why we started it, uh, because the, I'm a part of iPsych and iPsych was established in order to uh, study psychiatric disorders. And I will talk about this also uh, in my presentation. Um, but however, I mean, we have this very uh, huge resource of these 80,000 genotype uh, individuals. So it's also very, I mean, uh, it could be a very uh, huge interest to, to study additional phenotypes, for instance, substance use disorders, and in this case, uh, cannabis use disorder. So this is kind of a, a secondary phenotype that, that we are, are analyzing in, in the context of, uh, of, uh, of iPsych. And, and it's definitely also something that we would like to, um, I mean, go further with in the future and, and genotype uh, additional samples. So. Um, but uh, this study will uh, be about, about our genome-wide um, association study, which implicates CSRNA2 in uh, cannabis uh, use disorder. And first of all, a little bit about the background of cannabis use disorder. So lifetime use of cannabis has been found to be around 35 to 4% um, of adults in Denmark and, and the United States that uses uh, cannabis. And among these, around 9% become uh, regular users. And the overall prevalence of diagnosed uh, cannabis use disorder in the population has been estimated to be around 1 to 1.5% among uh, Europeans and Americans. And cannabis use disorder causes clinical and functional significant impairment, and it may lead to a range of adverse health problems like anxiety disorder and cognitive impairment where increased use of cannabis is associated with a decreased uh, cognitive uh, performance. And the heritability of cannabis use related phenotypes. So twin studies aiming to estimate the genetic risk component for problematic and diagnosed cannabis use disorder has found the heritability to be in the range of 50 to 70%. So it makes very good uh, sense to do genetic studies if we would like to identify risk factors for cannabis use disorder. And the estimate of the heritability for cannabis use in Asian and lifetime cannabis use with respect to amount of variants explained by common variants, also referred to as the SNP heritability, has been estimated to be in the range of 6 to, to 20 uh, percent uh, respectively for initiation and, and lifetime use. And just uh, very recently, there has been uploaded uh, a GWAS of lifetime cannabis use based on more than uh, 184,000 individuals. That paper is now in bioarchive. And there they have estimated the heritability to be 10% uh, for cannabis use. However, that phenotype is, is uh, quite different from the phenotype we're analyzing here, but I will come back to this uh, later on. And also now, uh, eight genome-wide associa association studies of cannabis use or cannabis-related phenotypes has, have been conducted, three with genome-wide significant findings. However, the replication uh, has been absent or uh, has been uh, ambiguous. So the aim of this study was to identify common risk variants associated with cannabis use disorder being based on genotyped individuals in the eyesight cohort. And ISAIC is actually short for the Lundbeck Foundation Initiative for Integrative Psychiatric Research. And what ISAIC has done is that we have established a nationwide population-based sample of around 80,000 genotype individuals. And among these, 55,000 um, are diagnosed with at least one of six major psychiatric disorders, which are autism, ADHD, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder and anorexia. And we also have around uh, 55,000 uh, randomly selected population-based uh, controls from the same nationwide birth, birth cohort. And the cases and the controls, they have been identified uh, based on register information. And subsequently, it was possible for us to go into the Danish newborn screening biobank and identify Godfrey cards with blood spots from newborn uh, babies and over here at the right, uh, you can actually see how to obtain uh, such a blood spot from a, from a heel prick uh, from a newborn baby. And then uh, we uh, were allowed to take a little bit or a little punch from these blood spots and extract uh, DNA from it and whole genome amplified in triplicates. And um, it uh, were genotyped using the site chip and this was done at the Broad Institute. 
And the design for this current study, in order to be a case here, an individual needed to have a diagnosis of cannabis use disorder, according to the ICD-10 codes. And we, uh, we did not include individuals with a diagnosis of acute intoxication, because this does not necessarily reflect uh, problematic cannabis use. And in order to be a control here, we took the rest of the individuals genotyped in the RSI cohort that did not have a diagnosis of uh, cannabis use disorder. So because RSI was established in order to uh, study major psychiatric disorders, we of course have a very high comorbidity, both among the cases and the controls with psychiatric disorders. So I would like to, to stress that we use covariates in our analysis in order to correct out the effect uh, for these psychiatric disorders. So uh, our GWAS was based on more than 2,300 cases and almost 49,000 uh, individuals uh, were used as controls. For the data analysis, we used more or less standard procedures for GWAS. We used the Recopili pipeline. So first we did the stringent QC. We filtered out SNPs and individuals with, a, with low call rates. We did a principal component analysis in order to remove genetic outliers and non-genotype markers were imputed using 1000 genome phase three. And then for the association analysis, we did a logistic regression where we corrected for the psychiatric uh, disorders, which I just mentioned, and also the significant principal component from the PCA analysis. And here you can see the Manhattan plot with the results from our GWAS of cannabis use disorder. So you can see that we were able to identify one very strongly genome-wide significantly associated locus on uh, chromosome 8. And we were, of course, uh, quite happy when, when we saw this uh, very strong, um, strong association. And furthermore, uh, we tended to replicate our finding, our genome-wide significant locus, in an independent cohort from Decode Genetics, which consists of more than 5,500 cases and around 300,000 population-based controls. And in this table, you can see the results from analysis of our index SNP. So you can see that it was uh, significantly associated in the decode uh, cohort. And you can also see that when we did a meta-analysis for the index SNP, it became even uh, more strongly associated or slightly stronger associated with cannabis use disorder in the meta-analysis. And additionally, you can see the results from five other uh, variants that were in, in quite high LD with our index SNP, and additionally two uh, variants actually became genome-wide significant in the meta-analysis uh, with uh, the results from the decode cohort. So um, as mentioned previously, uh, three previous studies or, or three other studies of cannabis-related phenotypes have identified genome-wide significantly associated loci. So we also looked up uh, those loci in the results that we had in order to see if uh, those loci were associated in our analysis. And here you can see that the p-value for the, for the variants previously found to be genome-wide significantly associated with cannabis use uh, or cannabis-related phenotypes, and those were not significantly associated in our study. And there could be various reasons for that. Uh, for instance, Shava et al. in that study, the phenotype that they analyzed were cannabis criterion count, and in our study, we used, as I mentioned, diagnosed cannabis uh, use. And also in the study by Agravel et al., uh, they used diagnosed uh, cannabis uh, as for, for their uh, definition of their cases. However, for the controls, they used uh, controls that has been exposed to cannabis use. And additionally, also that cohort, uh, or the cohorts that they analyzed, have been established with respect to study. Uh, various kinds of substance use disorders, where our, as our cohort has been established in order to uh, study psychiatric disorders. And then finally, there is a very large um, GWAS of cannabis use uh, based on more than 184,000 individuals by Passman and L that has just been available in, in bioarchive. But there, the phenotype is lifetime use, where they have a prevalence around 20 to 50 percent of the individuals that are actually. Uh, using cannabis. And again, we have a prevalence of around only 1% of, of diagnosed cannabis use in, in our study or, or the phenotype that we are using. So when going back and looking further into the genome-wide significant locus on chromosome 
8, we can see that it is uh, located in an intergenic uh, region. And additionally, this specific locus has actually also been found to be genome-wide significantly associated with schizophrenia in the last large uh, GWAS uh, conducted by the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. So it could actually be relevant to ask here, could the signal that we are observing in our study actually be confounded by schizophrenia or be confounded by any of the other psychiatric disorders that are highly comorbid uh, among our cases and also the controls, even though we try to correct for this in our analysis. So in order to evaluate this further, we did a Li1 field type out analysis. And here we estimated the effect on the odds ratio for our index SIP, the effect of leaving, on, leaving out one by one uh, the psychiatric uh, phenotypes. So in the first line uh, in this table, you can just you can see uh, the p-value and you can see the odds ratio for our GWAS of cannabis uh, use disorder. And then you can see the effect on the odds ratio first by leaving out all individuals having ADHD, both among the cases and the controls. Then you can see the effect of leaving out ADHD, bipolar disorder, the controls, major depressive disorder, and schizophrenia. And what you can actually see here is that the odds ratio uh, remains more or less stable, no matter if we left out uh, individuals with these psychiatric disorders. Uh, the only big difference is that the odds ratio actually deviated even more from one when leaving out individuals with ADHD. So this suggests that our logos or the signal that we observe is not confounded by any of the psychiatric disorders. However, this could actually also suggest that the signal that we are actually seeing in schizophrenia could be driven by a subgroup of schizophrenia cases that in reality has cannabis use disorder because we know that cannabis use disorder uh, has a prevalence of around 13 to 16 percent uh, among schizophrenia cases. So in, in order to evaluate this hypothesis further, we did uh, and as, or we tested the association of our index SNP with schizophrenia only in the eyesight cohort. So first we did a GWAS of schizophrenia, where we took all individuals having schizophrenia uh, against the controls. And in that study, we found that our index SNP was nominal significantly associated with schizophrenia with an odds ratio of 0 0.9. Then we did another GWAS where we excluded all individuals with cannabis use disorder. So we excluded more than 500 individuals among the cases and around 100 individuals among the controls. And in that study, uh, our index SNP was no longer significantly associated with schizophrenia and the odds ratio were much closer to one. And we also evaluated this, this by doing a permutation test where we randomly removed the same number of individuals among the cases and the controls. And the odds ratio for our index SNP when excluding individuals with a comorbid cannabis use disorder was significantly different from, from just random removal of the same number of cases and the controls. So this again could, could actually suggest that the signal that we are seeing in schizophrenia for this specific locus could be driven by a subgroup having cannabis use disorder. But this of course needs to be, uh, to be evaluated uh, further in a, larger, uh, in a larger sample. And then we also wanted to uh, evaluate further the potential functional impact of our risk locus. And our uh, index NIP was actually found to be a, a very significant and strong EQGL in, in GTEx for CHR in a two expression in the cerebellum. And we also tested this further by doing a GWAS of the imputed gene expression. And here we used predict scan and it was used to to impute the genetically regulated gene expression. And we use uh, SNP weights that was derived from models trained of reference transcriptome datasets from DTEx and the Common Mind Consortium. And in this table, you can see uh, the 11 brain tissues that uh, we tested, and you can see the number of genes tested in each uh, tissue. And we were able to identify one gene that was uh, significantly different expressed uh, between cases and the controls. And this was a significant underexpression of CHRNA2 in cases compared to the controls in the cerebellum. We had a valid model for um, expression of CH CHRNA2 in additional two brain tissues. However, here the, 
the, the, uh, the, the results uh, also suggested an underexpression in cases compared to the controls, but it was not significant after correction for multiple testing. And at the figure at the right, you can see on the x-axis, you can see the base pair precision. And on the y-axis, you can see uh, at the upper part, you can see the, uh, the log 10, uh, the minus of 10 p-values from our GWAS of cannabis use disorder, so for each uh, variant. And on the lower part, you can see the minus of 10 um, p-value for expression of CSR in A2 in the brain tissues. And all the lines are actually lines indicating which genetic variants are used in the model for uh, predicting the expression of CSR in A2. And we can see that the model uh, is primarily driven by variants located in our in our genome-wide significantly associated locus on chromosome 8. So CSR NA2, it encodes the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor alpha 2 uh, subunit, which is expressed in the brain. And candidate gene studies have linked this gene to substance abuse and nicotine dependence, but no genome-wide association studies have conducted or uh, have connected this gene to any substance use disorder or psychiatric disorder. Uh, at least not what I have been able to uh, identify from the literature. And since it has been found that, that variants in other subunits of the nicotine receptors have been strongly associated uh, with smoking, it's also relevant to ask in this study if our signal actually can be confounded by smoking. We don't have information about smoking of any of the individuals in, in, the, in the eyesight cohort. And we know that smoking is, is highly comorbid with cannabis use disorder. However, we also know that smoking is highly comorbid with psychiatric disorders. And we have also a very high percentage of psychiatric disorders also among our controls. So it is kind of unlikely that the strong signal that we are observing here is actually driven by smoking. But furthermore, we looked into uh, the, the variants that previously have been found strongly associated with GWAS of, of smoking. And then we looked into the, our results in order to see if we found any, uh, any signs of association uh, in our data. And we did not find uh, any p-values and not even nominal significant association of these variants in our GWAS of cannabis use disorder. And then also the other way around, we looked if our uh, genome-wide significantly associated locus have been uh, found to be strongly associated with any of the smoking-related uh, phenotypes that has been investigated in the large GWASs conducted by the Tobacco and Genetics Consortium. And here we did not find any, uh, or did, we did not find a very strong uh, uh, signals here either. So this also supports that what we are actually seeing here is not uh, driven by smoking. So how could it actually be that CHRNA2 could be related to cannabis use disorder? So a hypothesis could be that cannabis might interact directly with the alpha-2 subunit containing nicotine receptors. And this is because cannabidiol, a non-psychoactive component of cannabis, has been found to inhibit the alpha-7 containing nicotine receptors. And therefore it could be speculated that the alpha-2 containing nicotine receptors could be affected in the same way in the same way. And it might also be um, hypothesized that cannabis could interact uh, indirectly with the other two subunit containing nicotine receptors. And this is because that after binding of an agonist, uh, for instance, acetylcholine, uh, the nicotine receptors response by opening an ion conducting channel across uh, the plasma membrane. And this causes depolarization of the membrane and it can result in presynaptic a neurotransmitter release, uh, including dopamine, which is a known neurotransmitter involved in, in, uh, in addiction. And it has actually been found that the psychoactive component of cannabis, THC, it increases the release of acetylcholine in various brain regions. And it could be speculated that this, through the alpha-2 subunit containing nicotine receptors, could affect uh, dopamine release. And then finally, there could be a direct biological link between the expression of CSRNA2 and the cannabinoid receptor 1 gene. And this hypothesis is based on evaluation of gene expression correlations from uh, genome-wide microarray gene expression profiles in the LN brain atlas. Because of all genes evaluated 
CNR, uh, CNR1 or the cannabinoid receptor 1 gene demonstrated the strongest negative correlation with CHR in a 2 expression. And this signal was actually driven by opposite uh, expression patterns in a large number of, of brain tissues. So this could suggest a biological interaction between the endocannabinoid system and the alpha-2 subunit containing nicotine receptors. So this could also indicate that the risk locus that we find here, which is associated with decreased CHR in a 2 expression, could be related to increased cannabis receptor 1 gene expression. However, this, of course, uh, needs to be uh, investigated uh, much further, this uh, hypothesis. And then we also estimated uh, the SNP heritability. So the SNP heritability here was estimated to be in the range of uh, 9 to 4%, depending on uh, the method that uh, we used. So actually in the low, uh, in the low end, end of the range of heritability estimates that has been reported previously. And I would assume that heritability estimate actually would increase uh, if our sample size uh, increases in, in the future. And then we also um, did polygenic risk score analysis. So or maybe I should say that since our uh, sample size is not that large, it, we were not able to get valid uh, results from doing an analysis of genetic correlations uh, at LD Hub. So instead we did polygenic risk score analysis. So we analyzed 22 phenotypes related to cognition, personality, psychiatric disorders, reproduction, and smoking behavior. And we found that the polygenic risk score for, um, for eight phenotypes were significantly associated with cannabis use disorder. So first we found that increased polygenic risk scores for schizophrenia, ADHD, and depressive symptoms, as well as lifetime smoking, uh, increased the risk of cannabis use disorder. And then we also found that uh, increasing or increased uh, load of variants associated with performing uh, well in the school, uh, increased educational attainment or college completion, and also human intelligence were associated with a decreased use of or decreased risk of uh, cannabis use disorder. And this is actually illustrated um, in these quintile plots of the odds ratio for cannabis use uh, disorder. So for instance, here over at the right, you can see that we calculated the polygenic risk for or the polygenic load, you might say, for performing well in the school. And after generating the score, we divided our sample into quintiles, depending on the scores, so both cases and the controls, where quintile one represents the quintile or yeah, the quintile with the lowest load of variance associated with performing well in the school. And quintile five represents uh, the 20% um, the of the sample of the individuals having the highest load of variance uh, associated with performing uh, well in the school. And you can see as the, the load of variance for performing well in the school increases, the odds ratio for cannabis use disorder actually decreases. So in summary, we found one genome-wide significant locus uh, on chromosome 8, and this was replicated in an independent cohort from Decode Genetics. And we did not find any signs of confounding from schizophrenia or any of the other psychiatric disorders. And we found a significant underexpression of CHR in A2 in cases compared to controls. And this seems to be driven by the EQTLs in the risk lo locus. And there could, for instance, be uh, a potential unexplored hypothesis of related opposite expression patterns of CHRNA2 and CNR1 in a large number of, of brain tissues. And we also found, at, uh, we also found that the, the polygenic load for decreased cognitive performance was related to, or cognitive performance related phenotypes increased the risk of the cannabis use disorder. And then I would like to mention also that you can find our manuscript uh, on, the, on BioArchive and it's uh, currently in review in uh, Nature Neuroscience. So we cross our fingers for, a, for a, a acceptance. And then of course, uh, the acknowledgements. A lot of people uh, have contributed to this study. 
From my side, I especially would like to, to thank uh, Anna Spolo uh, and Vera Manikanen, and from Decode Genetics, especially Thorgia and Marat, who has been very helpful and, and in order to replicate our findings. And then, of course, also the people from, from State and Serum Institute that is running uh, the newborn screening biobank. And then especially also from the Danish side, we are very grateful to the Lundvik Foundation uh, because they have made it possible for us to, to establish uh, the eyesight cohort. Yes, so, um, so this was actually the end of 